Pastor Loudermilk from the Way of the Cross Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about our services and our service time and invite you to come and worship with us. We have many wonderful programs in place that would be a blessing to your family, our children's program, our teenage program, and, and the Bible studies and the church services that are geared for each member of your family. Way of the Cross Church is located at 612 Beatrice Drive in Riverside, Ohio. Riverside is a small community between Dayton and Huber Heights. Beatrice Drive is a connector street between Brant Pike and Harshman Road. The church is located again at 612 Beatrice Drive. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., of course, our main service. We have service on Sunday evening at 6.30 and then our midweek Bible study for adults and teenagers and children of all ages is on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I sincerely invite you to come and be part of these services, and God bless you as uh, you watch the program this evening. I've spoke to you the, the last couple of weeks about what are really difficult, difficult topics, difficult sermons for me. I, I like to talk about joy. I like to talk about peace. I like to talk about faith. You know, there's so many wonderful subjects in the Bible I like to preach about, uh, but you're you're not true to your calling unless you do deal with subjects sometimes that are difficult. And so two Sundays ago, I spoke to you on, on the subject of abortion. I really wanted to talk to the young people, really. Um, and what prompted that was the, you know, the news cycle about, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, the news cycle about uh, uh, what they were doing with um, what they refer to as a fetus uh, that's been aborted, but it's actually a little baby. It's actually a little baby. Its heart begins to beat when it's about three weeks old. It's a little baby. And I was so, so I spoke to you about abortions that day and, and how that there are no illegitimate children in God's eyes. Illegitimacy is a term that we have uh, conceived. Uh, you know, there are illegitimate parents I mean, obviously there are, uh, but every child, the Bible tells us children are a gift from God. And the only thing that's going to change the culture or the climate of our country, which is so important that we change, the only thing that's going to change is for a new generation to, to rise up and to understand the value and to know that a little baby, from the moment it, it, it's conceived in what should be the safest place, his mother's womb, that a little baby is our greatest natural treasure. A little baby, little children, little children are our greatest natural treasure. So I pray for young people. I pray. Now, I talked to my, my cousin in Alabama yesterday, and he asked me, he said, Bill... Are you still praying for a revival? He said, I've kind of got discouraged. He said, I've kind of quit praying for a revival. It seems like to me that it's not going to happen, so I've just been praying for Christians. And it really took me back. I thought, well, have I quit praying for revival? I don't want to quit praying for revival. I don't want to, I don't want to quit believing for revival. I want to believe that there can be an awakening, awakening of truth and, and knowledge in our time. I want to believe that. Uh, I said to my uh, grandson, Sam, picked him up from school one day, and, and uh, I always try to engage Sam in conversation, so a lot of times I give him history exams. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks about that, but we have a good time. We have a good time. But uh, I, asked, I said, Sam, how old 
was your little brother? How old was little E? How far along was little E when he was born? I was going to tell him. It surprised me. Sam knew exactly. He said, he said oh, he was 26 weeks and five days in his, in his uh, development. And I said, Sam, isn't that amazing? I said, Sam, two weeks before he was born, he could have been legally aborted. And this was, and it made, me, it made me feel so good to say, he said, I don't believe in that. He said, you know, he, he said, I, I, I'm try, I want to try to remember his words and quote him correctly. He said, I don't even believe that a baby should be aborted in the case of rape. And I said, Sam? He said, yes, because he said the little baby didn't have nothing to do with that. And he said, there's somebody who'll take that little baby. I thought, Sam, that is so good. I pray you're a voice of your generation. And then he went on. He made even a rash statement. He said, he said, I, he said you know, they say that even with a mother's life is at stake, and which is obviously a very difficult position for anybody to be in. And, and a person in that position, we should just, we should pray and ask God to give wisdom and help because they would need help. But he said, he said, I'm thinking, this is what Sam said to me, he said, I'm thinking about how a mother loves her baby more than she loves herself. And I thought, Sam, I'm so glad to hear you talk like that. And, and I believe that young people can know the truth. And I want them to know the truth. We, we, our, our job is just, well, anyway. So last week I talked to you about also an equally difficult subject. I talked to you about sexual immorality. Now I knew I had everybody's attention because every time you mention the word sex, everybody listens. And, and so I talked about sexual immorality and I read out of the scriptures. And we live in a very immoral time. We live, we live in a very immoral generation where anything and everything is acknowledged and accepted. And sometimes the things you hear about just absolutely boggle your mind. You know, you think, how could that be? I, well, I, I'm not going to preach last week's sermon again, but this was the text that I read, and I didn't read all of my text last week, so I want to finish reading it because it's, it segues into what I want to speak about today. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkard, drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And if it just stopped right there, I mean, you, you, would, feel, you, you would feel the weight of that. But that's not the end of the passage. The very next word, verse says, this is Paul writing to the Christians at Corinth. He said, and such were some of you, but you were washed. Ephesians tells, tells us that we're washed by the word. The Bible tells us we're washed by the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad that you can be washed? You, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, on, over in verse, verse 13, in, in the middle of the verse says, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. And God has raised up the Lord, and he will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know... Let, let me read verse 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, as opposed to being one spirit to sin, to our sinful relationship. But look at verse 18. That's the verse I want, really want to read here. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does or that a woman does is outside the body. 
But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now look at verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. What was the price that was paid for us? Jesus gave his life for us. You were bought at a price. You were purchased with the precious blood. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That verse 18, flee sexual immorality. There's only two places in the Bible that I know of where it te- we're told to flee. One of them's here. This reminds me of Joseph. You remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers into Egyptian slavery. And, but, he, but, but he was such an industrious young man, such a good young man, He found favor in the household of his owner, his master, and he promoted him to high position over his household and over all of his business. And then the the man's wife began to have designs on Joseph and tried to seduce him. And Joseph said, I can't do that. I would be sinning against God. I can't do that. And he she went to get a hold of him. This lady was something else. Lady's the wrong word there. Lady's the wrong word. This, this woman was something else. She went to get a hold of Joseph, and he ran right out of his coat. And ran out. he fled. It says he fled out of the house. Well, she figured she was going to get revealed, so when she waited and when, his, when the master came home, she accused Joseph of, and she had the coat where she had fought against him and, and all that. So Joseph wound up, going to prison even though he had stood for the right thing. You know, there'd be, it wouldn't it be wonderful to have a Joseph generation of young men and young women who just purpose in their heart like Daniel, they will not be defiled and they're going to stand for God and the right, stand for the truth. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Well, the other place we're told to flee it's also in Paul's writings. It's in First in uh, um, Second Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter six, where he tells us to flee from the love of money. So you know, uh, those are those are those are two fierce foes: immorality and love of money. You know, we're supposed to flee from them. F L E E. They are not F L E A's, are they? They are big problems. We're not running from some little minuscule, doesn't really matter, you know, doesn't have an effect on our generation. When we flee from fornication and we flee from the love of money, what we're doing is we're running to a righteous God. And he's becoming our fortress. Amen? And he's the one that will help us to stand when people around us maybe are not standing. Well, that was the last two weeks. And I I am thankful that I've had the opportunity to talk about those. Now, there is a third in my series of what I consider really serious problems that I want to talk about. And... Yesterday morning, I got up and left yesterday morning to go up to my daughter's house, and I, 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 I put our alarm on wrong, and my wife didn't know it. So when she got up, she set the alarm off. And, the, and about the time I got back, she set the alarm off. And I looked out, and here comes the police. And I have two cruisers in my driveway, and Joe calls me and says, uh, Pastor, is everything okay over there? I said, yeah, Joe, everything's good. So I'm apologizing to the police, reassuring, because, you know, they're busy. I I said, listen, I'm a police supporter. I've got a son-in-law and a brother that's police. I said, I'm I'm a law and order guy. And and I said, do you need my ID to know who I am? And he said, no, Reverend, I know who you are. (laughs) 
And then he said to me, he said, and I want to thank you and congratulate you and the congregation of the church for the way that you've worked with Jason Johnson. That's what he said. And he said, you know, and then he said to me, he said, also, don't give up on Virgil Pack. That's what he said. That's what he said. And, and so, you know, that kind of encouraged me a little bit because those two fellows had to fight what I want to talk. I'm going to talk to you about, um, I'm going to talk to you about the abuse of drugs and alcohol. I'm going to talk about that. And uh, not that I enjoy that, but that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, So, the reason I'm going to do that, because I'm a pastor, and as a pastor, I want to speak the truth to young people. I'm a parent. I love my son and my daughters, my son-in-law, and I'm so thankful that they are people of high moral standard. And lastly, the title that I am so thrilled about is I'm a grandpa. I'm proud of Maddie, I'm proud of Sam, and I am so tickled about little Lee. And I would want to stand for the right. I took a picture of him, posted it on, uh, I took a picture, I was holding him, and his little hand was cupped in my hand, and it touched my heart. And I thought, it's so important. Now, I know, who, I know his daddy and his mother are the ones that are guardians of truth in his life. But as a grandpa, I'm going to be right there behind them, you know. And I, I saw his little hand. I had, took his picture of his little hand cupped in my hand. And I thought, I want to do my part to make sure that my little grandson goes in the right direction. And I want to do my part to make sure your grandchild goes in the right direction. I want to make sure that your child goes in the right direction. So that's why I'm talking about this, because I I, I see it is such a dilemma. Now, so I have my own perspective about things. And um, let's see how high tech I can be here. Let's see if I can do this. You know, I I really have... uh, appreciated my access to um, the internet through my telephone because I'm not, you know, I'm 80, uh, no, I'm not 82, I'm 72 years old. I'll be 82 in 10 years. But um, drug abuse is a major public health problem that impacts society on multiple levels. Directly or indirectly, every community is affected by drug abuse and addiction, as is every family. Drugs take a tremendous toll on our society at many levels. Americans perceive drug abuse as a major public health problem. Many of America's top medical problems can be directly linked to drug abuse. Cancer. uh, Tobacco contributes to to 30% of cancer deaths. Now, we don't think of tobacco or nicotine as a drug, but it is. And I used to smoke. And I know, I know how difficult it was to stop smoking. So I'm not saying this lightly, and I'm not pointing accusing fingers. I want to say to you that you can, even if you've smoked all of your life, which I pray you young people never have that kind of report. But even, I have friends who've smoked all their life, and smoking is very difficult for them to stop. But I, I want to tell you that you can with God's help. And one of the amazing things about stopping smoking is they say that there is an immediate health benefit. Your lungs begin to clear and begin to heal themselves within two weeks. So I just wanted to say that. But heart disease. Researchers have found a connection between the abuse of tobacco, cocaine, amphetamines, and steroids. steroids, And the development of cardiovascular disease. Again, tobacco is responsible for approximately 30% of all heart disease deaths every year. Uh, Approximately one-third of AIDS cases, uh, and in most cases of hepatitis C, are associated with injection drug use. 
and approximately half of pediatric AIDS cases result from in injection drug use or the mother having a relationship with someone who's doing that. Uh, many of, of America's top social program problems are related to or, uh, or impacted by drug abuse. Uh, for example, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that drugs are used by approximately 10 to 22 percent, 22 percent of drivers involved in crashes, often in combination with alcohol. At least half of the individuals arrested for major crimes, including homicide, theft, and assault, were under the influence of illicit drugs around the time of their arrest. Exposure to stress is one of the most powerful triggers of substance abuse in vulnerable individuals and of relapse in former users. Child abuse. And I heard of a little baby this morning. Just this morning, I heard of a little baby that, there's, that in our city a little baby that's been beaten to death. At least two-thirds of patients in a drug abuse treatment center say they were physically or sexually abused as children. Drugs, drug abuse impacts the individual, the family, and the community. Everybody knows someone who is affected by drug abuse. Now, in adolescence, this is a time period of high vulnerability to drug abuse and other risk-taking behaviors. The consequences of substance abuse can, in, can include illness, injuries, and death. And you know, we have an epidemic of overdose of heroin here in our community. Each year, approximately 40 million debilitating illnesses or injury occur among Americans as a result of their use of tobacco, alcohol, or other addictive drugs. Approximately 460,000 deaths were attributed to illicit, illicit drug use and smoking last year. Prenatal. Young mothers, listen. Smoking. Infants born to women who smoke during pregnancy have a lower average birth weight and may be at increased risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, conduct disorder, and childhood obesity. Cocaine. Babies born to mothers who abuse cocaine during pregnancy can be born prematurely and have low birth weight rates. There may be as many as 45,000 cocaine addicted babies born each year. Child abuse. Approximately 50 to 80 percent of all child abuse and neglect cases substantiated by Child Protective Services involves some degree of substance abuse by the child's parents. In the community, homelessness. 31% of America's homeless suffer from drug abuse or alcoholism. Crime. As many as 60% of adults in federal prisons are there for drug-related crimes. Isn't that terrible? Education. Children with prenatal cocaine exposure are more likely one and a half times more likely to need special education services in schools. Special education costs for this population are estimated at $23 million per year. The workplace. Illicit drug users were more likely, are more likely than others to have missed two or more days of work in the past month and to have worked, three or more, uh, worked for three or more employees in the past year. Not because they're not people that need to, to work, just because of this is what happens to you when you get caught in the trap of drug use. Now there's, I want to read also, because sometimes people do not, uh, they do not associate, uh, they don't think about alcohol as being as bad. I, I, was, I was really concerned about preaching this this morning because I like to preach inspiring messages. And all day, all afternoon yesterday, I struggled. I thought, this is, this is what I've got in my heart, but nobody's going to be excited about that. And, and I thought, maybe I even got out some of my old sermons, some of my really good sermons. I very seldom preach a sermon twice, but occasionally I might. I, got, I found a really good sermon out of the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. I went to bed not knowing what I should do. I really did. 
just as I just as I was drifting off to sleep, my phone buzzed. It woke me up, <laughs> and I had a text, and it the text was this: somebody that I know, somebody I've known for many years, somebody who I've prayed a lot for. They said to me, "I'm sorry I haven't talked with you lately." just wanted to ask you to please pray for me with my alcoholic addiction. Now, if you don't think that was a word from the Lord to me, that was a word to the Lord for me. So I'm just giving you what's in my heart to give you. Now, Well, I've got off the site that I wanted to be on. It has to do with alcohol. And so I'm not going to bother that anymore. I think maybe I've made that point. I just want to tell you young people that something like 50, something like 70% of people that are alcoholics start drinking between the age of 12 and 18. Don't ever do that. And you won't. You won't do that. You won't do that. Now, my perspective is I think the overall view of Scripture teaches me to, uh, to know that Drunkenness is clearly a sin that will not be in heaven. We know that. That's obvious to everybody. But I acknowledge that there are Christians who see no harm in an occasional social drink. And they base this on examples of Jesus turning water into wine or Paul instructing Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. As a pastor, I'd like for you to look, consider some other truths also. Um, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, the, John referred to us, and this is Jesus speaking, where he says he has made us a, a kingdom of kings and priests. We are kings and we are priests. Peter called us a chosen generation. We are kings. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's made us kings and priests. You all realize that? We're going to reign with him. We are kings and priests with Christ. Now, and we should be reigning over the circumstances of our life right now. So, I would like you to see Proverbs chapter 31, verses 4 through 9. Proverbs 31, verse 4 through 9. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Or can I say alcohol? Alcohol. It is not for princes to drink intoxicating drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Okay? Now, if... You're not a king or a priest. Then give strong drink to him who is perishing. If, if that's all we've got, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you're going to die. Give strong drink to him who is perishing. Wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So if your inheritance is only going to be misery, poverty, bitterness and perishing then maybe alcohol is the best thing you can get the Bible says in Ephesians 5 don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the spirit you know Jason Johnson has such a he has a way with words one day he said to me he said pastor he said I've not found a high and Jason had a long period in his life 
this episode up and down, trying to get high, trying to chasing that elusive thing called high. But after his freedom and his deliverance, he said to me, he said, Pastor, I'm not found a high like the most high. And that's what I want to encourage. Listen, you, you do have to have something to be excited and, and, and focused about in this life. Let Jesus be the joy of your life. Walk with Jesus. Talk with Jesus. Let him be your strength. Let him be your constant guide. Listen, let him be your constant help. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He'll be more to you than anything this world has to offer. He'll be your wisdom. He'll be your righteousness. He'll be your strength. He'll be your counselor. He'll be your provider. He'll be the one that encourages you. He'll be your burden bearer. He'll be your everything. So, I'm, as a, I want to say to you young people, you're not perishing, and you're not in misery, and you're not in poverty. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, there are other scriptures. There are other scriptures that we could go to about that, but I'm just going to let that rest. Let it be there because I want to pray. Um, in Leviticus 10, which I'm not going to go there, but it, you know, it specifically says that a priest, a priest is not supposed to drink alcohol. So I am a king and a priest. Jesus made me a king and a priest. Now that's my scriptural testimony, my scriptural thoughts. I want to, I want to tell you about my testimony. One day I was at Kroger's, and I was in line. I was bored. And I started looking at the magazines. And they have these scandal sheets there, you know. So-and-so's doing this, doing that. And so I'm bored, standing in line. I don't read those things. But a headline caught my attention, so I'm looking at it. And there's a young lady from the church that grew up in the church. She come up behind me. And she said, Pastor, you don't read those things, do you? I, since that time, whenever I'm in line, I look the other way. <laughs> what would your son or your daughter? Let me, let me, let me find one here. They're, most of them are out for Sunday school. What would this young man what with this young fella? How are you today, son? God bless you. What's your name? Mikey. That's a good name. That's a good name. How old are you, Mikey? Eleven. Okay. Now, Mikey, who am I? Who am I, Mikey? Pastor Bill. That's right. Now, if Mikey's up there in Kroger's, and he sees Pastor Bill going through the line, and Pastor Bill's got a big box of what is, what's some of the beer they drink, drink now? I don't, I don't uh, uh, tell me, help me out. <laughs> Not that you drink it, Helen, I know that. <laughs> you just see commercials. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Bud Light, Bud Light. That's what I was trying to say, so thank you, Helen. Or what is, what's something else? What's another one? What? Okay. So they come through the line. They, they walk up behind me, and there's the pastor of the church. There's Brother Bill. There's Mikey's pastor. And he's putting that up on the... Because, after all, it's not a sin. It's not a sin if you don't get drunk. That, that's what some Christians say. And I believe they're Christians. I do. I accept that they're Christians. But there's Pastor Bill. And he's putting it up on the counter and there's Mikey what's Mikey going to think what who said that Mikey's going to think well it must not be that big a deal Pastor Bill's doing it or if while now now I you remember your testimony is important to you it's it is it's important to you it's important that you be 
And we all sin. Let me, let me make that plain. We all sin and come short of God's glory. And we're only saints because Jesus says we're saints. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one is what the Bible says. So I'm not saying that, that anybody's perfect or, you know, the, the prototype for what you have to be. I'm just saying, as a Christian, I have a responsibility to those who are coming after me. I have a re- my li- I took my picture picture of my little grandson with his head in mine. And you know, there's that that put your hand in the hand of the man who's calmed the water. There's a verse that says, "Every time I look in the holy book, it makes me want to tremble." When I think about the carpenter who cleansed the temple. And that's what I am. That's what you are. You're a temple of the Holy Ghost. You're a... T- I don't want to holler. This is, this is too serious for me to do a lot of hollering. I want to say to you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Look in the Holy Book and do some trembling. Look in the Holy Book and do some trembling. Now... So that's my take on all of it. That's my take on alcohol. That's my take on drugs. You know, usually people that are taking drugs, you know what they're usually doing? They're usually self-medicating. Because drugs, you know, it's easy for us to become addicted. It really is. It's, it just take a little bit of they, they Just smoke a little bit of crack, and you'll find out it's very easy to become addicted to it. It's not easy to get off of it. It's not easy to get free from it. So my take on alcohol and drugs and any substance that's foreign to our body, do you know that it's an addiction to gamble? Do you know people have prominent positions? There have been people in the community with influence and status and stature looked up to, and they have lost their position because of addiction to gambling. I want to say to you, friends, as a Christian, you should not be drinking alcohol. As a Christian, you should not be smoking marijuana. They're getting ready to vote on whether or not we legalize marijuana. So there'll be another case if they vote for it, and I, you know what? There was a time in my life I would never have dreamed that they could vote for marijuana to be legal. But they vote for a lot of things to be legal nowadays. This is an evil generation. And if you, listen, it, when things are dark, when things are really dark, that's when the Christian is supposed to let his light shine. Billy leads us all the time in that course. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Now, one of the best ways to let it shine, of course, is to love people and be good to people. That's a a wonderful way. But it's also a good way to not allow yourself to be entrapped with the snares of this world. I don't believe a Christian. I don't believe a Christian should use drugs. I don't believe a Christian should drink alcohol. I'm praying for the person who texted me last night. Said, please pray for me. You see, in my family, alcoholism. You see, there's no such thing as me drinking a six-pack of beer. If I were to drink a which is a foreign concept, I'm not going to do that. I haven't done anything like that in over 50 years, and I'm not going to do it now. I promise you that. But in my bloodline, my grandfather died from acute alcoholism. My dear aunt, I had an aunt that was such a beautiful, she was a beautiful lady. I I was struck with her beauty. I thought how pretty my aunt was. She was a beautiful lady. She died young from alcoholism. And she died, she died a really hard death from alcoholism. Her, I have two, I have first cousins. I have first cousins that their life is hopelessly Hopelessly, it would seem, it appears to be, I pray for them and I talk to them, but it would seem that their life is hopelessly ensnared by alcoholism. These are real things. I don't want any young person to make a decision to do some of those things because I didn't say something about it. I don't believe you should drink alcohol. 
I don't believe you should take any kind of drugs, marijuana, any of that. I don't believe you should do that. I don't believe you should smoke cigarettes. Not because I put cigarettes on the same level as some other things that we've talked about. I don't do that. And I, you know, I smoked. I started, I, I smoked. And one of the reasons I quit smoking, I had two reasons I quit smoking. One, I wanted to be a minister. I felt called into the ministry. And secondly, um, Charlotte told me she wouldn't marry me unless I did. And I wanted both of those. I, I, think you can, I think you can be free from that. I think you can. I don't say that judgmentally. I, I have a good friend of mine that when she quit smoking, this has been 30 years ago, she, she, she'd smoked ever since she was a little girl, and she'd smoked all through life, and she'd become a great Christian. She was, a, she was such a, she was a wonderful, she remains to be a wonderful Christian. And when she quit smoking, you know, I had such a, desire to help her. I called about every 30 minutes to see if she'd smoked a cigarette. I did that for about two weeks and finally she, she realized she was not going to be able to smoke. I know there's more than that. But I, I'm just saying, I did that. Because I do believe that you can be free from alcohol and drugs and tobacco. I believe, and gambling. You know, I, some of you remember Ray Hartman. I, I, every now and then I think I don't believe in reincarnation, but every now and then I think the spirit of Ray Hartman gets on Jim Perry over here because Ray Hartman used to give chewing gum. He'd stand at the door and he'd give away chewing gum. Oh, Jim, he, he likes to give you peppermint candy, and I'm so glad he does. I'm so glad he does. Ray Hartman was, an addict, was addicted to gambling, lost his job, lost his family, lost his home, lost everything to gambling. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And Jesus cleansed him. And Ray had such a joy to come to church. He wanted to be in God's house. He had such a joy to be in church. That's what the Holy Spirit can do for you. The Holy Spirit can set you free. Jesus, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he's come for. To set us free from the bondage and the snares and the things of this world. I pray for your children and your grandchildren. I pray for you. I pray there be a new love in your heart for the things of God. I pray that we, all of us together, will hunger and thirst for righteousness and that we'll never quit praying for revival. I pray that, Father, in Jesus' name.